thank you for having me here. Yes, I talk about metal. And so, basically, <laughs> exactly, metal. And um, I wanted to start saying the following. Rock and roll has been the soundtrack of youth rebellion for almost eight decades. It is probably one of America's most powerful cultural exports to the world. It may sound cliche to say that rock and roll is not just about music, but the moment it gripped a generation of American teenagers in the post-war, the youth would never be the same. They will reject authority, and their thinking outside the box will produce accelerated technological advancement. Latinx and Native American musicians had a major influence in different eras of the evolution of rock music and metal especially. When I was growing up in Peru in the 1980s, those were my teen years, it was a very violent country. We had shining past, we had terrorism. It's difficult to imagine how political violence can become endemic in a society. Uh, unless you leave it. I remember being at dinner time uh, with some friends in a restaurant and hearing an explosion. And we did what we were supposed to do, which is you cover your ears and you scream so it won't affect your hearing permanently. And because it wasn't, it didn't seem at the end to be that close, we just went ahead and kept on dying. And so that's how sick it can be. But heavy metal came to the rescue. Metal was loud and it had a lot of attitude, and it shielded some of us from the sounds of the violence on the street. And so, in a part, my presentation is a way to say thank you to those musicians who are still my heroes after all these years. So, anyways. We were talking about technological advancement. Well, it seems like American popular music has a very close relationship with transportation. Country music came with the horses. The blues came with the train. Rock and roll came with the V8 engines, the drag races, the motorcycles, and the financial access to them by the middle class and the proletariat. But one significant uh, advancement was that radios became this small. So you could muffle the radio with a pillow and listen in a clandestine manner to DJs that were forbidden by your parents, <laughs> such as Wolfman Jack, Adam Fried, and Dr. Hepcat in Austin, Texas, where I came from. Before that, radios were a big piece of furniture that stood on the living room where families would gather around and develop tastes all together. I like to think that rock and roll begins with Marlon Brandy. In the movie The Wild One, 1953, when his character is asked, hey Johnny, what are you rebelling against? His answer is, what you got? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you can be as cool as you want, but you'll never be Marlon Brando cool. <laughs> in, the 19, in 1958, something very significant happened. Uh, urban planning dictated that uh, home loans were given out based on the skin color. And so poor Jews had to share the same neighborhood with African Americans and Latinx. And from the combination of that, those cultures, like human mambo, which was loved by Suksut Pachukos, jam blues, which was loved by Grisos, and African American rhythms, comes out the first hit by Latinx rock and rollers called Tequila by the Champ. 1958 is a special year, too, because Elvis joins the army. And Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Whopper, who were topping the charts at the time, died in, in a plane crash. And so the establishment declares that rock and roll is dead. That's the first time of many. Rock and roll has attended its own funeral probably four or five times <laughs> in all these decades. However, every time that rock is dead, like they are saying right now, 
the loudest rocker carries on the torch. And in this case was Link Bray. He was a Shawnee Indian. He had a hit with the song Rumble. Rumble is the only instrumental song ever banned from radio. Because every time it came out on the speakers, you had a foot fight in the school cafeteria. <laughs> Steve Van Sand refers to it as Link Bray wrote the anthem to juvenile delinquents. <laughs> but what was important about this song, besides the distorted guitar, the three chords play with a lot of attitude, the loudness of it, the attitude of it, is that on the other side of the ocean, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, and Pete Townsend were taking notes and eating popcorn in, in America. This was going to be, this is influence is going to be felt by generations. In the 1960s, popular music take two marked directions. One is the wooded, acoustic sounds of musicians such as Bob Dylan and Richie Hale. The other one was the electric charge sound of the British invasion, delivered by the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Kings, and African-American guitar god, Jimi Hendrix, who gained fame after moving to England. Jimi Hendrix, who was half Cherokee, expanded the language of guitar. And in both his celebrated bands, Band of Gypsies and Jimi Hendrix Experience, uh, he utilized uh, drum patterns that are reminiscent of Native American drum. In the 1970s, another half Cherokee wore painted New Yorkian Ace Frehley becomes the quintessential heavy metal guitar player for the band Kiss, selling millions of albums and millions of tickets around the world and influencing thousands of loud guitar rockers. Another band that had several, actually all of the original members in the band were Native Americans, except for one was Blackfeet. But metal remained away from the uh, commercial radio. Commercial radio avoided metal, especially artists such as uh, Blackfoot, uh, Blackie Lawless from Wasp, who were very vocal and very uh, rude for a uh, commercial taste. However, in February of 1982, a band from Los Angeles, Quiet Rabbit, that had Cuban-born Rudy Sars on bass guitar and Mexico City-born Carlos Cavazzo on guitar, displaces the police synchronicity album from the number one position in the Billboard Top 200 album and their single, Come On, Feel The Noise, a remake of a song by the band Blade from England, becomes uh, a, a top five in the hot singles in Billboard as well. Rudy Sarso goes on to play with Ozzy Osbourne, Blue Oyster Cool, Dio, White Snake, and currently with the guest who, among many others, an absolutely remarkable career. The success of uh, Quiet Riot helps a bunch of other bands with Latinos in it to uh, become commercial or mainstream. Among them, Twisted Sisters with guitarist New Yorican Eddie Ojeda. Twisted Sisters is more important than what it seems right now, but for example, here is Dee Snyder in Congress testifying against censorships uh, by um, uh, then Senator White, Peter Gore. Other notable players of the time were, for example, uh, Cuban Juan Crochet, a uh, bass player with rap. Tico Torres, a uh, drummer for Bon Jovi, uh, whose parents immigrated from Cuba, and Mexican-American Robert Trujillo from Suicidal Tendencies and Metallica. Also, Mr. Tom Araya, born in Chile, 
and Cuban drummer Dave Lombardo from Slayer. A very important band in the 90s especially was Rage Against the Machine, fronted by Mexican-American Sac de la Rocha, very politically vocal, and uh, supporters of the Frente Farabundo Martí de la Liberación Nacional in El Salvador. Talking about El Salvador. Brujeria is a band that was formed in the, front, in the uh, border with California but actually on the Mexican side, it included Raymond Carrera, Dino Casares, and Yellow Biafra. Uh, Casares and Carrera eventually will form um, um, I'm forgetting the name of the man. Uh, no, not Kelly Record. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, I, I, I apologize, I forget the name. Uh, but anyways, that's Brujeria. They sing about sat Satanism, they sing about drug trafficking, they sing about um, very political, uh, strong political commentary, commentary. But also in the late 80s and 90s, Tampa develops a very strong death metal scene with bands such as Cannibal Corpse, Morbid Angel, Terrorizer. Um, Pete Sandoval was born in El Salvador. He's, a, uh, uh, he's the drummer of Terrorizer and Morbid Angel. He is considered the father of the Blast Beat. Blast Beat was a split, it's a extremely fast drum fire that utilizes two kick drums. It's the signature beat for almost all black metal and death metal or thrash metal. I don't know if you ever heard that sound that goes taka 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 taka. When I interviewed him, I told him, hey, I also, you know, he grew up during, uh, uh, when El Salvador was going through also political conflict. And so I told him, hey man, I know that sound. That's the sound of a machine gun. Is that correct? And he said, yes. That's where he got the sound. Anyway, <coughs> as we were talking about black metal, black metal may have started in Newcastle, England with the band Venom. Venom was, or is, still a very openly anti-Christian outfit. Um, the anti-Christianity of Venom gets adopted in the Scandinavian countries by the youth um, as a reaction to the uh, Catholic Church pedophilia scandal. But also, it takes shape because uh, they want to revitalize their original native culture, which is Odinism. And so they see Christianity as an invading culture. That same philosophy is utilized in other native populations, giving birth to two new genres of metal. One of them called, is called red metal. Red metal takes place usually in Navajo reservation. Um, it has to do with the same, with the Christianity invading the original native culture. Navajo, which is a very good example of that. The other genre is called indigenous metal. Probably the most successful indigenous metal band is Semicam from Guadalajara. They use traditional instruments besides the usual, the usual metal gear. They sing in Nahuatl, which is the language of the Aztecs, which is spoken by over two million people, including the American Southwest. And they have played the most uh, important metal festivals in the world, such as Hellfest and Walking Open Air. And I'd like to conclude this presentation saying the following, because I want to advance your son. Just like African Americans utilize rock and roll, among other musical genres, to protect their heritage, such as gospel, for example, I believe that Native Americans are utilizing metal and hard rock to protect theirs. This is Chica Solo, Randy Castillo. He drummed with uh, Ozzy Osbourne, Little Four, and Molly Group. Over the years, unfortunately, he died two years ago of cancer. And uh, <clears throat> this is the story of Latinx and Native American musicians, and I'm more than happy to share it with you.